Hi everyone and welcome to this tutorial with me Tim Clapham here on the Maxon YouTube channel. Now if you don't know anything about me then um, here's a quick intro. Basically um, originated from the UK and now live in Australia and here in Sydney I run a company called Lux um, and this is the website and if you want to see the work that um, we produce at Lux then visit lux.tv and you can have a look at some of the work that Lux has um, been involved with and also some of the work that um, I've produced when collaborating and working with other studios. Um, if you're interested in seeing um, some more of my tutorials then click on the blog um, and visit hellolux.com and here you'll find plenty of tips, tricks, tutorials for not only Cinema 4D but also for After Effects. So don't forget to check that out and if you do visit the site then please um, feel free to leave me a message. Um, I'm going to be using Cinema 4D Release 13 for this tutorial and we're going to be creating an animation from scratch right through to rendering at the end and I will be using Release 13, um, specifically the physical renderer but for those of you that haven't yet upgraded, um, don't worry you'll still be able to follow along with most of the tutorial um, specifically um, elements such as working with MoGraph, um, setting up some lights and camera, those kind of things if you don't have release 13 and you want to find out some more about it, then head on over to maxon.net where you can check out the new feature set and it's a pretty fully featured release. Um, but enough of that, let's get on with the tutorial. Um, so to do this, we need to jump over to Cinema 4D and then we can get started. Okay, before we start making anything in Cinema 4D, there are a couple of files that you're going to need to download to follow along. Um, and they consist of an Illustrator artwork of a jigsaw puzzle piece that I've drawn and also a JPEG and the JPEG we're going to use to just create a picture on the front of our jigsaw puzzle so you can use um, some artwork of your own instead of that JPEG but you will need the jigsaw puzzle illustrator file um, there should be a link on the YouTube page so just follow that link and then you will have the file the only thing to make sure if you do use um, artwork of your own then it needs to be um, square so if the aspect ratio is non-square, it might look a little bit squashed if you follow along. So just try and make sure that your artwork is square. So once you've downloaded those files, you need to locate that Illustrator um, artwork and bring it into the scene. Now the first thing we should really do before we um, do anything in our scene is just set up our document settings. And here you can see that the project settings are open. And you can access these by pressing Command D. Um, and I'm going to work at 25 frames a second and the maximum time is going to be 124 frames. So we've got 125 frames in total because we actually start on frame zero and we're working at 25 frames a second. So it's only going to be five seconds long this animation. Um, if I open up the render settings, I'm going to just switch to output and I want to set this to 1280 by 720. So we're going to be working at um, 720 HD and 25 frames a second. Once you've done that, come to the file menu and just choose Merge Objects. Locate the Illustrator file that you've downloaded, select this and click Open. And the dialog that opens, just set the scale to one if it's not a one already. Um, I'm gonna work in centimeters and then click OK. So here we have our jigsaw puzzle piece. I'm gonna to switch to coordinates, just make sure that this is at world zero, which it is. Now with the Alt key held down and the spline selected, come up and add in an extrude nerves. And because we hold Alt down, what happens is the extrude nerves becomes the parent of the selected object. And I'm just going to call this puzzle piece. And you can see that it doesn't look quite right. We've got a bit of a hole here. So if we select the spline, come to object and just make sure that close spline is enabled. And as soon as we do that, you can see that we have the caps on our object. Select the extrude nerves once again, come to the object tab and let's set the movement on Z to be 5 and if we switch to caps I'm going to set the start and then the end to fillet cap. Let's set the start steps to 3 and the radius to 2 and I'm going to set the end steps to 1 with a radius of 1. The other thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to come down to the constrain option and enable constrain and if you watch the shape you can see that what happens is it tries to constrain um, the shape of the extrusion to the spline. In other words the bevel doesn't add any extra um, border to it. Uh, it. It kind of bevels inwards. 
Um, you have to be a little bit careful using constraint depending on the shape that you have. If you have holes in your spline, then very often what will happen is um, you won't get the result that you that you require. So um, just use constraint with a little bit of caution, but in this example, it works just fine. Okay, now we have the puzzle piece made. We can um, obviously create loads of duplicates of these and make our jigsaw puzzle. And um, we're gonna need to rotate them for the pieces to all intersect correctly but first of all let's um, look at one of the ways that we could do this now there's a few different ways we can do this and depending on how you want to approach this there are different issues and problems with um, the various approaches I'm going to show you one method and then show you why it doesn't necessarily work and then show you an alternative method that does work um, so let's select our puzzle piece hold down the alt key come up to the MoGraph menu and add in a cloner and again because we're holding alt our puzzle piece becomes um, the child of the object that we add um, and here we go you can see that the cloner by default is set to mode linear so let's set that to grid array first of all and I'm going to use a count of 10 by 10 um, so I'm going to set x to 10 um, y to 10 and then on z I'm just going to set that to 1 now we need to um, obviously spread them out um, to the right amount and uh, I know that a value of around uh, 1 0 to 1.5 should work in here and for the Z size I'm just going to set that to 0 if you press H on the keyboard we can frame our um, object and there we go and you can see that we have our puzzle um, and it's kind of linking up correctly along the vertical columns but um, across the horizontal rows um, it's not working because we need to rotate every other piece in fact it's not even working on the uh, vertical columns I'm not sure what I'm talking about there um, because obviously these um, pieces here are intersecting so we need to um, rotate them so one way we could do this um, is simply with a shader effector and we could um, use a checkerboard pattern because um, we can use the the values from the checkerboard to control the rotation of our pieces so with the cloner selected come to the MoGraph menu just add in um, a shader effector now by default the shader effector will scale the pieces up so we need to switch to parameter first of all and just uncheck scale I'm not going to um, affect the color either so I'm just going to set the color mode to off now so what we need to do is rotate them um, and if we come to rotation and enable this and let's set bank to be 90 now, of course, at the moment, it's rotating them all 90. So we need to say, um, rotate this, don't rotate this, rotate this, don't rotate this. And we can use um, the checkerboard shader for that. So if we come to the shading tab and come to the shader list, come down and choose surfaces, checkerboard. And you can see that we have white, black, black, white. And what will happen is that um, where it's white, it will use the full value under parameter 90 and where it's black it won't use any value it will use zero and if we used um, a gradient with grays then um, it would interpolate that parameter value between them so in other words um, mid gray would be uh, between naught and 90. so we need to um, arrange this checkerboard across our jigsaw puzzle and we want it to really fit here across these four and then tile um, and if we look at the cloner you know that we've got 10 by 10 and we want it to cover the first two so we need to kind of tile it um, five times in the shading tab of the shader effector um, underneath the checkerboard shader that we've added you can see there's a section for mapping so fold that down and you can see here that we have a current length of x and y of 100 um, and because we want to have five across we need a fifth of that so we can put in here 20% and if we put 20% on Y you can see it's starting to work um, we've still got a bit of a problem here uh, here but you can see over here everything is starting to work now the reason we have a problem here is just because of the way that tiling works and what happens with tiling is when you tile things the shader actually wraps around so um, what we can do to get around that is we can just make that um, a slightly higher value to just get around this problem if we set those to 20.1 you can see that that then fixes it and that's because the wrapped around shader is being pushed off the edge um, and now we have our jigsaw puzzle pieces all in place so it all looks good and everything seems to be working okay one thing you might have noticed is as I drag around there um, 
it disappears out of view. And this is because we're kind of creating quite a lot of geometry. We didn't optimize anything as we went. Our spline is set to the default values um, and we've cloned all these jigsaw puzzle pieces regardless of how much geometry there is. And already with just this simple shape in our scene, it's already um, starting to become pretty sluggish. So we don't want that. So we need to think about how we can optimize this as well. But before we do that, I want to show you one of the problems with the technique that I've demonstrated here. Now, because this is a jigsaw puzzle and we're going to want to apply an image to this, and the idea that I have is that the jigsaw puzzle assembles and then we fly the camera through it and it all breaks apart as the camera flies through it. So we're going to want a um, the, the picture to assemble correctly um, over the whole of all of our pieces and we're going to want B the picture to stick to the pieces so that as the pieces move the segment of image that is on that piece stays on that piece. Um, what we've done here is we've taken the pieces and we've rotated them so when we add our picture to it this is going to cause us a problem because all the pieces are going to rotate and our picture won't align. Um, the easiest way to show you what I mean is to actually add an image and apply it to the jigsaw and then you can see the problem and why we need to approach this using a slightly different technique. So if you're going to use your own JPEG um, you need to um, just create a new material first of all by double clicking in the material manager and I'm going to call this um, puzzle front and select the material and in the attribute manager switch to the color tab. I'm just going to switch to the basic tab actually and just switch off specular for a moment just so we only have the color channel active. And down here are the texture slot. You need to click on the big button or on the ellipsis button here and load your image in. If you're going to use the image that you downloaded um, from YouTube, then by all means use that. So I'm just going to click here and load that image in. Now you will need to make sure that you save that JPEG in um, a, a relevant place. So if you have saved your 3D file, you need to save it in the same folder or in a text folder within that folder. Um, otherwise you're gonna end up with an absolute path here. So you can see that it's basically the um, release 13 box. Um, and if we right click on this preview, we can just switch that to plain so we can see that preview more clearly. So what we need to do is map this over all of our puzzle. So I'm just going to drag this and drop it onto the cloner object. And you can see that we don't get the correct result straight away. And the reason for that is because we're using UVW mapping. And we have this extrude nerves object which um, doesn't have great UVs. Um, you can see that we've got some UVs around the extruded part but none along the faces. So it's not much use like that. So what we need to do is map this using flat mapping. So select the texture tab, come down to the um, attribute managers switch to the tag tab and under projection switch that to flat. If we select the cloner object and also switch to our texture tool you can see here there's like a yellow grid which represents the projection that we're using at the moment. Now we want that grid to be over the whole of our um, jigsaw puzzle. And there's an easy way to do that. Just make sure you've got your texture tags selected. Come to the tags menu, come down and just choose fit to object. It will then ask us if we'd like to include our sub objects. And of course we do want to include the sub objects because that's the puzzle pieces. So just click yes. And you can see that it then calculates that for us. If we want to check that it's done that correctly, we can switch to the coordinates tab and just check that the size here is the same on X and Y because we know that our image is a square. And if we render this now, you can see there we have the image over our jigsaw puzzle. So it all looks great. There's no problem. Well, it doesn't seem like there's a problem, but as soon as we move any of those jigsaw puzzle pieces, what's going to happen is the texture is not going to stick to them. We're using flat mapping. The mapping is based on the kind of axis of the cloner. As we select these objects and look, you can see um, the yellow grid that defines where the texture will be. As soon as we move a puzzle piece out of this space, it's going to move out of the texture space and because this is tiled which we can see under tag tile what will happen is that it will start to repeat the pattern so that's not how we want our jigsaw puzzle to work and if you want to see that happening um, the easiest thing is we can just select our cloner come to MoGraph add in something like a random effector okay and you can see that as they move um, the the image isn't moving with them and if we just set these to be like 200 by 200 so they move a little bit further. You can see that what is happening here is it's starting to um, repeat the box down here. And you can see the white part is starting to repeat here. 
um, instead of that blue section sticking to it. Um, so that's definitely not the result that we're after. Now there are a couple of ways to um, get around this and one of them is built into the cloner and if we select the cloner object and come to the object tab under here we have an option to fix texture. Aha! So that's the exactly the option that we want to use. Um, so I'm just going to get rid of this. Now I'll leave the random effector but I'll just leave it disabled. Um, and In the cloner let's set this fix texture parameter to be on. Um, as soon as we click it we've got a few different options in there. Now the one that we really want to use is straight. Now the reason we have alternate X and alternate Y is if you want to use it for creating things like um, a card wipe um, so that you flip all of your cards around and what will happen is it will arrange the textures correctly on one side or the other so as they flip around it assembles. Um, but we're not doing that we're just um, rotating every other puzzle piece 90 degrees. So if we choose straight let's see what happens. The first thing that you'll probably notice is that the puzzle now looks incorrect. Now the reason that it's done this is because it's actually stuck the texture on and then we've applied our shader effector which has then rotated all the other pieces. So it's actually doing the right thing. It's us that have set this up incorrectly. If we switch our shader effector off so that all of the pieces are how they were originally you can see that the actual texture itself is now mapped correctly. But of course, the problem that we have now is none of the jigsaw puzzles fit together. But if we switch our random effector on so that everything moves, you can see that we don't have this fixed flat texture anymore. All of our pieces are moving into these different parts of space and the texture that is stuck to them is stuck to them. So we need to think of um, a different way of actually assembling our jigsaw puzzle because using the shader effector like this isn't working because when we come to um, assembling all of our pieces you can see that every other piece is rotated which means that our texture is all rotated. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually um, step back and rebuild the jigsaw puzzle again using a slightly different method and this will allow us to um, rotate our pieces. Um, and while we're at it we might as well look at how we can optimize this because if we switch on our random effector you can see it takes a while to actually redraw the screen and if I come up and adjust any of the parameters um, I'm not getting any kind of feedback or, or at all and you know you just can't work with a scene that's like this you need to have feedback all the time and of course um, we can optimize our scene to make sure that we get that kind of feedback as we rebuild our jigsaw puzzle we need to determine what it is that's causing um, this slowdown and um, it could be that we're using really high res textures or it could be the amount of geometry in the scene or it could be a combination of both. Um, so let's just take our texture tag and let's just delete that off of the cloner for now. Okay and if we select our random effector and just scrub the strength for instance you can see that the feedback um, is non-existent so it's definitely not the texture that causing the problem. I would say it is pretty much guaranteed that it's the geometry. Let's just disable everything in our scene except for the extrude and the um, spline. If we select the puzzle piece extrude nerves and press O to frame that object and let's just have a look at the amount of geometry that we have here and you can see that as a single object it's not too bad but we've got so many polygons all the way around these edges and then we've got the, uh, the fillet um, and then we've also got the caps as well and although they look like they're one um, object they're actually an engon so they're made up of lots of triangles internally and if we come down to the um, caps of the extrude object and change the type to be uh, triangles you can see all the triangles that are created and they're actually there even with an engon all that happens is um, with an engon they're kind of hidden edges they're not real edges they're virtual edges but they still exist um, at render time so there's quite a lot of geometry on that one object now the geometry on an extrude nerves is defined by the spline itself. Now of course we want to keep these curves as smooth and um, all of the shape um, defined as accurately as possible but at the same time we need to keep that polygon count as low as possible as well. If we select the spline itself you can see that at the moment intermediate points is set to adaptive and it uses an angle of 5%. So basically what that means is all of those intermediate points on that spline which are the points that are used to create the polygons are defined by the angle between each point. If that angle is um, lower than the threshold then what happens is it adds in more points. So in other words on very straight areas you get 
less points and on very curly curved areas you get more points and if we select the puzzle piece you can see that's the case as we come around these um, tight curves you can see that there are loads and loads and loads of segments but then as soon as we get to an area where it's a little bit straighter there are less segments so it's a really efficient way of generating a spline but perhaps we are generating too many so just to experiment for a bit, let's increase the angle. Um, one thing we could do is set this really high, say 35. You can see as soon as we set that to 35, we have a problem with the shape. Um, if we select the puzzle piece, you can see the number of segments is like decreased hugely. Um, we've got hardly any points around these curves now, but the problem is obviously it looks terrible. There's no way we want to use this for our final scene, especially if we're going to render it at HD. We're going to see all these jaggies. So what we could do is we could set up two different shapes and we could have one that's really low res like this um, for working and animating and then we could have another high res version that we use um, for rendering. And that's exactly the setup that I'm going to do. But before we do that, let's just um, switch our cloner back on and let's just see what the feedback is like now if we switch on the random um, effector. And you can see that now I can actually drag the strength up and down and we're getting feedback in the viewport. It's still a little bit sluggish. Um, we could do things like switch off the uh, fillet cap. So we've just got a cap for each one. And now we'll probably find that it's um, even quicker. We could even come in here and we could say, well, I don't want anything on the back of it. I just want a cap on the, on the front. Um, that's the only part I'm interested in while I'm animating. And now you can see that it's really quite snappy and we're getting the kind of feedback that we want. And if we compare, compare that to the feedback that we had before, which was pretty non-existence, then we're obviously um, doing the right sort of thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make two puzzle pieces and I'm going to bring them in um, and we can switch them out at render time. Okay, there's a few different ways to do this. Um, I'm going to just select the puzzle piece and copy and create a new document and paste it in. Now, I'm going to do it this way because depending on whether you're using release 13 or whether you're using an earlier version will depend on whether you have the new xrefs or not and if you don't have the new xrefs uh, or you've got the old one there's different ways to do it so I'm just going to do it this way which will work for everyone um, and on this puzzle piece I'm going to call this puzzle piece um, high and I'm going to set fillet cap for both start and end I'm going to set that to be end gons for the type um, and there we go and I'm going to come to the actual spline and set the angle um, down a little bit lower we probably don't need it to be as low as five um, we could set it to ten maybe I and mean, you can see that it started to create a kink there All right, let's just leave it at five for this example it doesn't matter we're only going to use this at render time anyway um, there's not that many objects in the scene if you're starting to get memory problems then you can do things like this to um, reduce the number of polygons in your scene to get around any memory issues that's fine let's just leave it like this so I'm going to save this as a puzzle piece high as a um, separate document okay I've saved that in the same uh, directory as the original scene now I'm going to just call this puzzle piece low and for this I'm going to um, set this to just be a cap with no cap for the end and I'm going to set the uh, jigsaw puzzle spline to have an angle of say 40 um, which is pretty low and you can see we've got this really chunky looking jigsaw puzzle piece now and I'm going to save this as puzzle piece low back in the master scene I'm just going to delete the puzzle piece from this scene and come to the create menu and just choose add xref Next, I'm going to choose Puzzle Piece High and click Open. Now, this is where things differ between um, release 13 and the earlier releases. This XREF is a new feature with actually release 13. And you can see when we select this under the Object tab, we have our ref reference object. And then we also have an option to load in a proxy or um, a low res version. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on the ellipsis here and load in the Puzzle Piece Low. Okay, once we've done that, if we just press O to frame that object, with release 13, you can simply click exchange with proxy and it will switch between the two. So that's pretty handy. So we can then use this um, in our cloner and we can then switch between the high and low res versions. If you don't have release 13, I've got uh, release 12 here, which um, some of you may have, or even 11, 11.5. 
If you come to the objects menu and choose objects scene and then add in an xref, you can see this adds in the older xref and under the object tab we have a very similar option, file name, you click on the ellipsis button and you can load your um, reference file into there. You don't have the option to actually switch that out. Now you could do this using instances in Expresso or a little bit of jiggery pokery um, to make your own automated proxy switch. Um, but alternatively, you can just manually link in your high res version and then when you want to render, you have to remember to come and manually switch out to the low res version. So you can still use the same principle, it just hasn't got a little switch in there to make it quite as easy. Um, so if you're using an earlier version, that's the kind of method that I would suggest. Um, alternatively, you can do it using instances, as I say, and a little bit of espresso. And there are some tutorials um, online for that but that's not something that I'm going to go into right now. So coming back to the scene, if we take our puzzle piece high and drop that into our cloner, let's select the cloner and let's just press O um, and you can see that if I just switch off the random effector that everything's working um, as it should do. Um, if we enable the random effector everything is really sluggish and slow if we select our puzzle piece and exchange for the low res one now we should um, be able to get some feedback so the um, switching out is working so now we just have to um, look at a method of rebuilding this so that when we add our texture um, we can enable it to stick to the cloner but without um, every other piece rotating and that's the next thing that we're going to do Okay, the next task is to rebuild the jigsaw um, using an alternative method. And what I'm going to do is create um, basically two cloners that use um, uh, two alternate methods. And then we will clone those two cloners. So let's just take our cloner. Um, first of all, I'm going to remove the shader effector and the random effector. Select the cloner under the object tab. Let's switch this to linear. Okay, so we're going to just create um, a single row of jigsaw puzzle pieces set the count to 10 and I'm going to set the BY to 0. I want to move them um, along X. So for the X value I'm going to use I think it's like 114 okay and if we just press F4 to jump to our front view and let's just zoom in a little bit closer and it's probably a good eye at this point to just switch this out and use the high res um, version select the cloner again and what we want to do is um, under the transforms in the object tab we want to set bank to 90 so it's going to um, rotate each one 90 and if we just zoom right in a little bit closer so we can see this and let's just switch off the extrude so we can just literally see the splines um, and you can see that they're not bad um, but they're not perfect and maybe if we make this 113 um, see so that's not quite right so it's 113.5 something like so so 113.5 looks pretty good okay so we've basically created one row and what we need to do is we need to create another row above this if we grab our puzzle piece high and we just uh, in fact grab the cloner itself hold down control and add in another one by dragging if we then select the spline in the um, second cloner object, what we can actually do is we can rotate this. Now this is a feature um, which is exclusive to release 13. So for those of you that are using release 12, you'll have to use a slightly different method, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to basically just rotate our um, spline 90 degrees, like so. So we create the other um, set of puzzle pieces that are rotated 90 degrees to start with. If we then take this cloner and we move it up um, 113.5 like so, we now have our second row and you can see that um, we've done this without any effectors, everything's all in its original place and now all we need to do is take these two cloners and clone them up to make our um, jigsaw puzzle the whole thing. Um, of course we can enable our extrude nerbs and we can see the results so far. Um, for those of you that are using um, an earlier version, you, you're not going to be able to do that because if you're using XREFs, they don't allow you to actually um, access the objects in the object manager, so you can't change any of that. 
So you're going to use a slightly different method. So if we just jump over to um, release 12, I can show you an alternative way of achieving this. The first thing you need to do is to open up the um, scene that you're referencing in your XREF. So here I've got the puzzle piece high. Um, and you're going to need to do this for the high and the low um, so you can switch between them. And all I've simply done is taken the puzzle piece and I've made a duplicate of it by control dragging. And in this one, I've rotated the, um, I've actually rotated this one. Um, and I've rotated the spline 90 degrees um, on bank. Um, so basically, if we just pull this out, you can see that we have two jigsaw puzzle pieces. Okay, I'm just going to undo that. So I've got those two puzzle pieces. Um, if we close this down, and here we have um, the XREFs that I've made. Um, and these are release 12 XREFs. And you can see that I have each one. Um, this one's rotated 90 and that one isn't. And, but they're referencing the same file. And the way that you can do that is if you select the XREF um, in the Attributes Manager, you come to XREF Object. And here you can see what it does is it shows you all the objects that are included um, within that XREF. And all I've done is I've disabled one of them. Um, and then on the other one, I've disabled the other one. So we now have um, a very similar setup to before. Um, and all we need to do is um, do this in release 12 or 11.5 and you can then use the same XREF and have your two rotated versions. So you can't actually rotate the spline itself in the object manager. You have to do it in the um, referenced file and then disable um, the including of uh, the alternate pieces. So hopefully that makes sense. So coming back to our scene, you should have um, two cloners. And I'm just going to close these up. Come to the MoGraph menu, add in another one, and let's call this Cloner Puzzle. And if we drag these two cloners and drop them into here, and we set the um, object Y transform, and what we need to do is we need to set that to um, an amount so that it moves up uh, the same for each row. So it's 113.5. And there we go and you can see if we set that to 10 we now have all of our pieces um, and everything's a little bit sluggish because we have all of that geometry so we will need to switch out to our low res version but now we have um, our puzzle built using cloners but we haven't needed to use any effectors or any of the um, transforms in the cloner here either um, because that will upset our fixed texture parameter so we should be able to map our texture onto it now and we should be able to fix texture and then use um, random effectors or whatever other effector we want to use to animate it and the puzzle pieces should work and the texture should stick so it's a good idea to check that before we move on and if everything's working okay um, then we can um, start setting up the animation and we can set up our lighting and our textures and our camera etc grab the puzzle front material that we created and drag this and drop it onto the cloner puzzle object. Um, if we select the tag and choose projection flat and then come up tags and choose fit to object just as we did before. Now um, we should see our texture mapped over our puzzle pieces, which is cool. And then what we need to do is we need to select all of our cloners and under the fixed texture option, set this to straight. So we can't do it just for the top cloner we need to do it for all of them um, now if we select these two cloners and uh, we come to MoGraph effector and add in a random effector you're going to see first of all a problem with using this technique because we have the same random um, positions applied to all of our rows that we've created because basically it's applying the random effector to these two cloners and then duplicating that up so that can be a problem um, let's just change the random mode to noise um, and I'm going to set the space to global and now if we just increase the strength say a thousand or so you can see that it's working um, and our texture is sticking uh, it's a little bit difficult to tell because um, as we drag um, we're not getting any feedback so perhaps this is a good time to come in here and just select um, both of our X refs and if we come down and um, exchange them with proxy. 
So once we click that, it will exchange the geometry for our low res version. Um, and we should be able to now select our random effector and um, drag around and see that everything's working as it should. So if we take the strength up a little bit higher, you can see that the artwork is in fact sticking to the pieces and everything's working as expected. Pretty cool. So we don't need the random effector anymore. We've built our puzzle using a slightly alternative method. Um, a few more cloners in there, but everything works as it should, which is the main idea of the game. Now, there's one other thing that I'd like to do before we do actually wipe this on, and that's just make the shape of this a little bit um, more irregular, just as if uh, some pieces were missing around the edges. Um, at the moment, it's a square, and it'd be nicer if it looked a little bit more random. I'd also like to center the uh, puzzle into our world center because at the moment everything starts off from this lower right hand corner so if we just select the cloner puzzle and i've switched to the front view here we can just drag this down and kind of roughly position it so it's a little bit more central and then as we add all of our other elements um, they're going to be centered around the puzzle um, rather than having to offset everything to compensate for that so i'm going to come back to my perspective view just press h now to create um, a kind of little bit more of a random edge, what we can do is we can use an effector to control the visibility of our um, clones. And for this, I'm going to use a shader effector. Um, but rather than use the uh, built-in shaders, I'm going to create a material just to show you that you can do that um, using a material as well. And if we just double click in the material manager and let's just call this visibility. In the attribute manager, let's switch to the basic tab and just switch off the specular. Um, under the color channel, come down to the texture slot and let's add in um, a gradient. And what we can do is we can use um, the brightness values of our gradient to determine whether our clones are visible or not. I'm just going to right click and uh, set this to be a plane just so that we can see a flat version of it. Click to open up the gradient settings and in here I'm going to set this to be 2D box. Okay, and um, it's probably a good idea to drop this onto our cloner so we can see what it looks like um, and we can tell where our clones are going to be visible or not. So let's just, um, what we could do is drag our material onto the cloner puzzle um, and create another texture tag. But we've already got a tag up here set up with the projection that we want. So why don't we just control drag this tag to create a duplicate. And if we drag our material and drop it onto that tag, it will just replace um, the material that's being referenced here with our new material and you can see now um, the result that we get so what I'd like to do is just come back to my gradient I'm going to just right click and choose invert knots and I'm going to grab this white knot and pull this right up like so we now have uh, this kind of black around the edge um, and what we can do is we can uh, add in some turbulence here and I'm going to set this to say around 25 you can see that kind of eats in a little bit more and what I'm hoping to do is where these black parts are and um, we can make these pieces disappear I'm going to reduce um, the scale to 50 and that's the scale of the noise that's used and then what we can do if we're not happy with the look of this is we can actually kind of jump through the seed values and we can also come in and uh, rotate this but it's probably a good idea before we start messing around with all of these to um, actually apply this to an effector uh, so that we can see the pieces um, actually disappear um, and that will give us a good idea of the aesthetic that we want now I want to keep this tag on this object but obviously I want to see my um, Cinema 4D box I don't want to see this noise so we can move this tag and place it to the other side so now um, it won't be rendered it's just there as a reference but by keeping it on this object um, it will keep the mapping and its axis and orientation the same even if our cloner moves around so if we select our two cloners um, that are inside here and come to the MoGraph menu choose effector and add in a shader effector and let's just call this shader visibility and then we can use this to control which of our pieces are visible or not you can see that it's already scaled up the pieces so we need to switch to parameter and just uncheck scale I'm also going to set color mode to be off 
Now at the bottom here we have the option for visibility. So let's just enable this checkbox. Next thing we need to do is to uh, tell it um, a shader or a material or a texture tag that we would like to use to control our visibility. So if we switch to the shading tab, at the moment here we have our channel set to custom shader and that allows us to then use any of the shaders within here. But we've already mapped a texture um, over the surface of this and we have a texture tag. And if you check on our material, you can see that we added our gradient into the color channel. So what that means is in the shader, we need to say, okay, what I want to do is I want to use this texture tag and I want to use the color channel of the material that it's referencing. So we choose color, then we grab our texture tag and we drop it into this slot. And you can see we immediately have a result. If you look at the preview for the material and you look at the um, result, you can see that where we have white, we have a uh, pieces visible and where we have black we have pieces invisible um, so we can actually come in and adjust our shader and we should get a real-time update um, we can create an aesthetic that we're happy with so I'm just going to click to open the gradient again one of the things I'm going to do is uncheck cycle um, and you don't really notice that in this preview here but if you look down in the material manager you can see that what's happening when we have cycle enabled is it's kind of cycling the gradient or it's tiling the gradient and I don't really want that to happen so I'm just going to uh, switch that off and we can obviously adjust the turbulence and the octaves and the scale etc or we can adjust the uh, the rotation and you can see that as I move this um, we get feedback in the editor so I'm just going to set this to be around minus 25 um, and we're just going to jump through the seed because this will give us a totally different look each time and you can do this until you reach one that you're happy with um, I can spend all day doing this, but um, I think that we've got better things to do. But hopefully you guys can just find some aesthetic that you're happy with. Um, I'm going to just leave mine like so. Um, if we want to eat in a bit more at the edge, we can, of course, um, adjust our black and our white gradient, uh, depending on how much we want to uh, kind of remove from our setup. But let's just pull this back over and set this something like so. Okay, I think that's fine. So it's just a little bit more irregular. Um, we could certainly choose a different option for, uh, if we have many of these, choose a different seed or something so that we had um, a slightly different look for each one.